Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Soldiers of Cinema podcast. As always, I am Cullen McFader, joined by Clark Coffey for another episode, another lovely, fantastic, fun, exciting, in-depth conversation, the modern-day Siskel and Ebert. Uh, what? Wow. Oh, my. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay, there's a couple things to unpack here from the, is this intro. Number one, mm. I'm, I'm glad you're still Cullen McFader. That's good, yes. as always. Yeah, yeah. I, it w- I would be super freaked out if you were like, you know, gay, you know, Introduced yourself as someone else. I, I, I mean, I so could do a name change just to switch things up. <laughs> stage name. Day. You need a stage name. Maybe we yeah. both yeah. do. And mm-hmm. uh, at, at first of all, that was, just, that was a lot of really uh, flowery uh, adjectives used to describe our <laughs> podcast there, right? Uh, which, hey, I'm not going to disagree with any of them. I mean, I feel like it's right on. Other people might think, you know, it's a little indulgent, you know, maybe a little, you know, Full of ourselves, but I, I feel like I agree with most of that. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that was one heck of an intro, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm trying to hype up the uh, the episode. So I, I, I love it too, though, how it's like you're like the tone of your voice is like pretty chill. Like, you know, you, you maintain like a pretty chill inflection, right? But uh, but yet still, I feel like somehow, you know, manage to impart the awesomeness. Of the, <laughs> of what the lies ahead of cinema for podcast. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, have we even gotten to the film yet? We haven't even No, not there. yet. No. This is your pick, man. So yes. uh, introduce away, young sir. Well, so I, you know, I've been wanting to do a Coen Brothers movie for, for quite some time and perhaps now, wait, inspired we've done by. A, have we not done a Coen Brothers no, film? No. And, and I think no, subconsciously impossible. inspired by the fact that you chose um, In the Name of the Father, which is a film that you hadn't seen. Right. I decided to basically go for what I believe is the only Coen Brothers movie I've never seen, which is, uh, of course, in the episode title, Raising Arizona. Um, so, figured I'd knock that off my list. So. Son, you got a panty on your head. Just drive fast, eh? Turn to the right! The first time I met Ed was in the county lockup in Tempe, Arizona. Flower you are. A day I'll never forget. I do. You bet I do. Okay, then. My lawless years were behind me. Our child-rearing years lay ahead. But <laughs> biology conspired to keep us childless. You go right back up there and get me a toddler. I need a baby hide. I got more than I can handle. At the time, Ed's little plan seemed like the solution to all our problems. And the answer to all our prayers. He's beautiful. What? Are you kidding? We got us a family here. I want Nathan Jr. back. What's his name? Ed Jr. Hi, Jr. So far, we've just been using Jr. We call him Jr. He's out there somewhere. Hold on, Nathan. We're gonna go pick up Daddy. I'll be taking these huggies and, uh... Whatever cash you got. <laughs> you busted out of jail. We released Krishaz on our own recognizance. What Double here is trying to say is that we felt the institution no longer had anything to offer us. <gasps> we got a child now. Everything's changed. Yeah! Where's Junior? <laughs> Who the hell are you? I'm a fan. We're absolutely going to get him back. Just ain't no question about that. Give me that baby, you warthog from hell! And <laughs> hey, you want to know another thing? I'm going to be a better person from here on out. <laughs> Let's go get Nathan Jr. Raising Arizona, a comedy beyond belief. Well, it ain't Ozzy and Harriet. Wow. Okay, so I'm totally surprised we haven't done a Coen Brothers film yet. And I almost don't even believe it. Out of all the episodes that we've done thus far, which is approaching 80, we've not done a Coen Brothers film? No, not yet. No. Wow. Okay. And then two, you've not seen Raising Arizona? It's one of those things. I mean, I feel like we all have those movies where it's like you're, they're classics and you yep. have known about them for eons. And yeah, yet, you just you don't just get never... to it. 
gotten the chance to sit down and watch them. So that's that's this one for me. I, like I feel like I already knew everything about this movie and just hadn't yet seen it. Well, I, I mean, look, it, it makes sense. I mean, the movie was released, you know, 20 years before your birth, almost. 10, you know, only 10, 10, 10, 10, yeah. 10 only 10. That's what, gosh, yeah. I, you know what? I've known you for so long. Like it, it's like you've, you've aged before my I hope eyes. That I wasn't born in, in uh, 2008. <laughs> you've, you've aged before my eyes. I, I, uh, but, uh, okay. I was just being a little cheeky there, but, um, but, uh, I, I mean, you know, look, I can, yeah, I've got films like that too, right. Where it's just, there's, Hey, there's, I mean, there's only, you know, there's only so much time in a life and there's so many films, you know, how can you see them all? Well, I, I'm glad that we're rectifying the fact that we haven't covered a Coen brothers film because I, with the exception of maybe one or two, and you know, I absolutely adore their films. And and frankly, mm-hmm. even in the films that I find like least enjoyable, there's still something there that yeah. that's that's good about every one of their films. Um, they're they're extraordinary, and they're a couple of my favorite filmmakers. Um, but let's dive in. I mean, I'm especially interested since this is the first time you've seen this film. I'm especially interested to kind of hear your initial first viewing thoughts on the film did you like it what were you know just as you were watching it i'm curious because it's i think it's so unlike i mean we'll get into this but it's it, it's uh i think the second film that they made and it's so unlike their later films i'm really curious to hear your thoughts on it yeah i definitely I mean i i, I enjoyed it a lot i think that the like what you say is true that it is very if you went into this after seeing, you know, one of their later movies, you would feel there is definitely a difference in style and in, you know, even just attitude towards character and, and story and everything like that. Um, but I think that there also are a lot of through lines. There's a lot of, uh, you can see the seeds of what they ended up going into and what how they ended up making their their choices. And I can't remember if we... We didn't do uh, Hard Eight for an episode, did we? We've we've never done Hard Eight, I don't think. I don't think so, no. Because I was going to say, it kind of reminded me of, of not in any way stylistically, but just kind of watching Hard Eight and seeing how different PTA was then than he is now, and yet you still have these kind of nuggets of Well, I mean, I would... What he... If you're going to parallel PTA, I mean, I feel like Blood Simple is their Hard Eight, and yes. this yeah, yeah. is Boogie Nights. yeah. Yeah, but this one's a lot kinetic and and yeah. yeah. But but did you? I'm just but but before we get into the analysis stuff, we're gonna have tons of time Mm -hmm. for that Mm -hmm. all that analysis stuff, analysis, analysis, cc, analysis, cc stuff. I just like (laughs) what what was like your viewing experience? Like what like just just on like pure like audience level that kind of vibe. Yeah, I I think so. I, I liked it a lot. I I I mean it's great. It's like really funny um nick cage is fantastic i enjoyed him throughout it i think that one thing that kind of caught me was just that there there still is this kind of semblance of like a regular movie in here where Mm -hmm. where it's like i almost found that it was in a lot of ways the kind of the anti like badlands or or sugarland express where it's about this couple who you know obviously wants a baby and they commit a crime and yet in very like classic Cohen fashion and one of the things that I love about them and definitely loved about this is just that it's almost always feels like the stakes are super low. Like that, that, (laughs) that nobody is actually really in any danger, which I kind of, you know, that wouldn't work for everything, but they do it in such a style that it makes it work because you just, every Mm -hmm. character is just written so well. And I think that that's kind of what sucks you in anytime. I will say that I didn't like, I don't think this would be one of my favorites of theirs. I don't think Mm -hmm. that, this has, you know, surpassed my my other loves for for uh, the, the Coens, but I think that it definitely. I mean, like you said, where it's like it, 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 I wouldn't even say that there was there wasn't anything I disliked about this. So even on that level, like there are certainly movies of theirs that I have liked a lot less. Um, but I think I don't know. It's it's kind of one of those things where I knew what to expect going in because they okay, are so such you did specific. Know filmmakers and yet i also was really surprised at how different a lot of it was from a lot of their other work like again like like this very kinetic Mm -hmm. um you know i know that their friendship with sam raimi obviously 
was really, really close at this point, especially. And so I find it interesting how even though nowadays they're very, very different filmmakers, you still see a lot of weird stylistic crossover between the two of them and I kind of this borrowing of, of ideas and clearly they you know you can see how close they were especially that Evil Dead 2 would have come out the same year um and even just in Nick Cage's performance how like he's so physical and he's so like his hair is just going crazy and it almost <laughs> in a weird way kind of reminded me a little bit of like Bruce Campbell's like over the top very or even like Jim Carrey and Ace Ventura oh, yeah almost. absolutely well his outfits in this are basically yeah. Jim Carrey's yep. and yep. Ace Ventura. Yep. But no, I mean, I think, and I love so you dug it. in this too. So you um, dug it. Ultimately, yeah, you dug the film. It, you thought yeah. it was, okay, I was just, because it's, I mean, I feel like you have to start there, right? It's mm -hmm. like, just as an audience, because it like, we're going to spend the rest of the podcast going into, you know, the nitty gritty of it all. But really, it's like, you start with this, like, we're audience members first. It's like, we're cinema lovers first. It's like, did, did you laugh? Did you cry? Were you moved? Were you entertained? Were you bored? You know, I feel like that's kind of like fundamentally you've got to start there. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, that's that's interesting. We'll like dive into it. Like you 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 touched on a lot of things. I think we'll we'll dive into in more detail in a minute. I mean, for me, I mean, this film came out in 87. So I was 11 when it was released. Uh, I did not see it at the theater being 11. Um, but I probably I saw it not there not long thereafter, you know, probably a couple of years after on HBO or something like that. Like so many films that were released in this era I saw on television. Um, I mean, I wouldn't have even been old enough to have like rented this on VHS. You know, I wouldn't have known to rent this on VHS. I'm mm -hmm. sure that this just came on on HBO and I just happened to be watching. And, you know, I didn't know who the Coen brothers were. I would never heard of of uh, Blood Simple at this point in time. That would not have been a film that would have interested 11 year old Clark uh, or 12 or 13 year old Clark. You know, um, I remember very specifically this film being on heavy rotation on cable TV. And I remember watching it and just being totally freaking blown away. I mean, it, you know, you got to, I mean, imagine like a 13 year old watching this film, right? Mm -hmm. It almost seems like the perfect audience for this film. Especially, you know, growing up in the Midwest. You're getting and I, <laughs> yep. And I just absolutely thought it was hysterical. And, but, but even more so, I mean, I feel like this is one of those films that, I mean, and I saw this before Evil Dead. I didn't know who Sam Raimi was. I, you know, none of this. I mean, this is one of those films that I think it ex expanded my, like, horizon. Like, it, you know, kind of blew my mind as far as, like, what cinema could potentially be. Like, mm -hmm. like here's an avenue. Here's a tone. Here's a style I'd never seen before. Like, I had never seen something like a like a live cartoon in the way this is a live cartoon. Mm -hmm. And you talked you talked about how, well, you, you the stakes don't ever feel like, you know, nobody's going to get hurt, right? Mm -hmm. It's a comedy, not a tragedy. It's like, although there are tragic kind of elements in it, which, of course, is vital for comedy. But, yeah, I mean, you know everybody's going to be okay in the end. Um, it's and it's kind of just like uh, like a cartoon and it's you know the tattoos that Nick Cage has right of is it like who I don't even know is it like Woody Woodpecker I think it's Woody Woodpecker because I think they but, designed his hair based off of Woody Woodpecker so, so even there you know it's kind of a nod to like it it's almost would have been better if it was like the Roadrunner or something because I feel like it's almost like Wiley e. Coyote you know like it's people chasing each other and shooting at each other and all this oh, I mean, stuff. That but bit it's, in the grocery stores, but it's like Acme, fantastic. but it's yeah. like Acme. No, but you know, nobody's really going to get hurt, but, yeah. um, but it's exciting nonetheless. But yeah. So when I first saw this film, I mean, I remember I used to walk around like qu quoting this film and, and just like randomly where it didn't even make sense. Like I, I remember, I just thought it was hysterical where he, Nick Cage is running around with a nylon on his head and he like, you know, grabs the trucker, right? That old guy in the pickup mm -hmm. truck. And, and a guy turns over and he's like, son, you got a panty on your head. I just <laughs> used to say that. I used to just like walk or around the, uh, saying when, that. When, when they're in, all the people in the bank are on the floor and then uh, um, Holly Hunter runs in and what do you say? Just get on the floor, ma'am. It'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the, and the it, guy who robbed pretty them, little honey John Goodman or something. and, and, uh, and uh, what's but, his name, are, are long gone at that point. I, I just, I, I just, 
I, so, you know, for my like 13 year old mind, it really did blow my mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, the music was surreal to me. Um, just a, co a combination of all these elements. I mean, I had just never seen something quite like this. And it wasn't just that it was a live cartoon. It was like the stylized language. It was, you know, um, and there is a heart in this film. It's not just a, you know, slapstick for the sake of slapstick, right? Like I'd mentioned, you know, you're talking about Nick Cage and his hair and his costume. I kind of just made a little parallel there to Jim Carrey and Ace Ventura. I mean, those are both slapstick movies. These movies mm -hmm. couldn't be more different. Just couldn't be. This has such a different heart. It does have heart. And you can tell that as outrageous as these characters are, the Coen brothers have a love and affection for them. They aren't making fun of these characters, any of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, the, I mean, I absolutely loved this film when I was a kid. I It, it had a big impact on me. Um, well, yeah. you know what I also I think is interesting about this too is that there, there was almost this, this feeling throughout that I, I was thinking like, there's a bizarre, not bizarre, but but it's unusual for the Coens to kind of explicitly reference things mm -hmm. in the way that they do here in mm. both style, like like you said, with cartoons and things like that, but even like how, um, you know, our, our, our bounty hunter, um, Road Warrior Leonard Smalls, he immediately made me think of the Road Warrior. Yeah, no, exactly. When I was, I was gonna a kid, say, he looks like he's dressed in the Mad Max universe. Yes, and with yep. the shotguns and all well, on his back. And, and, and there's even very specifically, I mean, um, like if you watch the original Mad Max film, one of the bikers runs over Mad Max's wife and child, and, yes, which yeah. is a fundamental aspect of like that character's backstory and creation, where he turns from Max to Mad Max, and mm -hmm. you even have like the baby shoes. Uh, and and the camera after the explosion and all that doesn't yeah, yeah. show the biker running over the baby right or the toddler just shows the shoes left kind of tumbling. We have a very similar imagery here where mm -hmm. one of the totems of the biker and the, of the bounty hunter in this film are like a bronze pair of baby shoes. And so there's there you're right. I mean, and that was the other thing. I mean, as a kid. It was like one of the first instances where I almost felt like a filmmaker was like communicating to me like, oh, they must have loved the Road Warrior too. Yeah. Ah, yeah. like I see, you know, I get it. Ah, we're on the same page, filmmaker. Like, oh, cool. You know. Well, so I also like, I think it's it's neat too because I I when I was watching it, I didn't realize that Deacons hadn't shot this. I don't know why, I, but it's their next film, yeah. Barton Fink, that, that Deacons Sonnenfeld. came on for. Barry Sonnenfeld and, shot this. Uh, yeah, Barry Sonnenfeld. And he shot the, Blood uh, Simple, their the, first the, film. The, yeah. the cinematographer for this. And and yet, I found it so funny when John Goodman and... Um, Williams and Forsyth? What's his name? Ewell or whatever. Enel, I think his name is in the movie. Um, it's, when they break I, yeah. out of prison, even though Shawshank Redemption came out, I think, five or six years after this, that scene ah. plays like a parody of Shawshank Redemption, and yet it, it there's no way that it could have been. <laughs> and I was actually thinking at the time, I was like, oh, I guess this is where Deacons practiced his Shawshank Redemption scene because it kind of looks the same, and then realized afterwards that it's not, yeah, it's not Deacons. And I was like, oh, that's, that's very kind of wild. That it's almost it like it's clearly you know there's no way that it is parodying a movie that would come out five years after it. But maybe maybe and Shawshank yeah. saw saw in, in inspiration in yes. this though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but just the way that he's yelling in the rain yep. and the, the thunder and, the and all that—I was yep. like, "This is, this is very funny." Um, but yeah, there and and then again, like there's also this this kind of uh, like Badland, Sugarland Express, um, you know, they're out in the desert, kind of it's like in yeah, the like this, and, yep. and this like outlaw couple kind of thing. But they're not really outlaws in this, and that's that's where the comedy comes in. Is that well, a Holly Hunter's a cop. So obviously she's not an outlaw. At least, at least for the first part of the film, yeah, yeah. the first and, act, and, yeah. and B, you know, Nick Cage might be an outlaw, but he in this again, like this wonderfully of Cohen's hearts. way, they, he's not like even like the parole board kind of, yeah, are like they just kind of scold him like a teacher would, yep. and they're like they're like now you what are you doing sure, here like, again, son? You know, yeah. just are you telling us what we want to hear? And and then even again, like going back to, like you said, where it's like this Acme styled cartoon where people are chasing that, that wonderful, wonderful 
like set piece of him trying to get the diapers and steal yeah. diapers oh, from a store and then he so just good. keeps losing the diapers so he keeps running to another store to get the diapers <laughs> and it's just going through these places and people are screaming and there's just like everybody's shooting carts. at him like everybody to me reminds me so much of like sam raimi's sense of humor too yeah um yeah. but the way that it goes through that and it's like you never again you're never worried that he's going to be shot and killed or anything, even no. though the cop, you just hear the bangs of the gun constantly throughout the whole scene. And the store clerk is also chasing him. Um, but you just have this like wonderful sense of just fun and like chaos. And yeah. like well, you and said, it's, like it's like an old Looney Tunes and, cartoon. I mean, it, and it's such a specific, it's, it's, and that's the other thing, even though it's slapstick, it's very specific. And it's one Mm -hmm. of the things that the Coen brothers have always been so good at. And I think any filmmaker that's good, uh, it's an absolute necessity of that is that it's specific perspective, specific Mm -hmm. point of view. And the Coens have always had it. I mean, since day one and their sense of humor, I think, is so specific. Um, I don't mean niche, but I mean they're specific in the execution of everything they do. So even though it is, it's like a live, you know, action um, cartoon, it's slapstick in a lot of ways, it's still very specific. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's a big part of why it's so great. I mean, you know, I want to talk to, you know, just kind of walk through some of this, some of the aspects of this film. And I'm curious what you thought, think think about this, having just seen it for the first time, Uh, because I didn't really remember this until I saw it again last night, was how long the introduction is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got almost a 10 minute long, narrated, fully narrated, basically introduction Mm -hmm. to the film. And it's almost as if the entire first act of the film is this narrated introduction, this prologue, if you will, almost. Uh, I was surprised. I didn't remember. Uh, And I think it's, it's such a place where a film could have really messed up to have mm. 10 minute introduction narration, but they do such an amazing job of setting up the entire rest of the film in a humorous way. Cage's narration is superb. It's mm-hmm. like such a potential pitfall, but they do such a great job of it. I, I had, so I was, I was, almost, I was like, I could, I didn't remember that, that the, you know, the opening credits don't come up until like 10 plus minutes into the film. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, the other thing too, about that intro is like you, you were introduced to so many characters that just don't end up coming back at all, but it, it serves a completely different purpose than plot. It serves to set up tone, which I think yeah. is super important. Sets up that tone, like, sets up and character. And it sets up so much about Nicolas Cage's character, how, you know, the first time he's and in Holly prison, Hunter's there's the, the guy mopping the floor that growls at him and is kind of like, <laughs> right. but then by the end of it, he's like happy to see him in this funny way. Like it's, and so it just kind of sets up this, that, that Nick Cage's character has this, I mean, it's a totally romanticized vision of this, like, this, well, that's like, what's. I'm, well, a, we, I'm a happy outlaw, but it's such an innocent version of that well, see, too, which it, is great. Which and it, and it's because it's all from his POV, right? Yeah, He's the yeah. narrator, and so it's one of the really beautiful things about the film is that you hear him commenting on his life while we're seeing it. Mm-hmm. So he and you're right, and it, and it's it educates us so much in his character because we see the contrast between what really happened and how he's describing it. And so that difference lets us in on his perspective. And mm-hmm. you you gave a great example where he's describing prison and how, you know, oh, they're, you know, it's like coming home to a, you know, to like, you know, to family almost or something. People, you know, yes, it's tough, but there's so much, you know, there's there's some really beautiful things there too. And really all we see is like the growling, you know, nasty, you know, they didn't have a lot of budget. And you can see that they uh, there were limitations in that, but they did such a great job with creating all these shortcuts for things. And so we really don't see anything about prison except for the guy talking in a cell about crawfish and mm-hmm. the the nasty guy mopping every time he walks in. And that's pretty much all we're ever exposed to as far as yeah. prison goes. You know, we see his booking over and over again. But, you know, so they also use it to great uh, effect showing the progression, you know, of, of how the character is kind of... Uh, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, but kind of moving towards a relationship with Holly Hunter's police character. And anyway, it yeah, I I was surprised about that. I didn't remember that uh, being such a part of the introduction of the film mm-hmm. that it was so long. Um, but uh, they, I, I've seen films where I don't think I think that kind of narration can really uh, slow a film down. Can kind of be a pitfall. 
but they nail it here. I think it's hysterical. Oh, uh, totally, yeah. And and I mean, I, I the other thing too about the Coens that I think is consistent throughout all of their their work is just that they do have an incredible talent for writing like one scene characters, like characters that are just not even supporting mm-hmm. characters, but just characters mm-hmm. that show up for one two minute scene Moment, yeah. that maybe have you know five or six lines that again and i'm going to go back to the the old, the old man in that bank robbery when um john goodman and uh, william forsyth are they're like robbing freeze that little bank. get down and, and like, the guy's like well do i freeze do, do i get... freeze but he and he's not even like arguing with him he's just yeah. kind of like pointing out the logic in the situation and then he's like and then when he says shut up it's like well okay like I, you I'm know it, do what it, you want me to do it's but. almost a great a great parallel to the um to the character in the gas station and uh, no country for oh, old yes. men yeah. where you know the character is kind of almost this dumbfounded kind of just it, it dumbfounded by the ridiculousness of, of the scenario it's not that mm-hmm. they're dumb like that character is clearly not dumb he's actually yeah. kind of smart he's like well you just uh, commanded us into a, a contradiction which one do you want mm-hmm. and it's almost like that the the character that's kind of dumbfounded by um, Javier Bardem's character in um, No Country for Old Men, where he's like, mm-hmm. "What are you? What are you talking about? Flip, flip for what? What do you? What in the world do you mean? You know, it's just interesting. A little bit. They're different characters. They have different purposes, but it's just interesting that you see this. I think this theme over and over and over again. Um, they're clearly interested in kind of rural, kind of country folk, but uh, and, and you know they use them. I think sometimes. Uh, obviously to comedic effect but also to i i don't I, I don't feel like they're ever making fun of these characters yeah no um, it's like the it's kind of the positive side of like naivete where it's like they're naive but in a in a not in the negative sense in the way that's just kind of like well i would never assume that somebody would be yeah wrongdoing like um like i'm it's just sh- going to get to the bottom of this situation by asking questions and so it always <laughs> works and so you, you get again that's kind of what i mean when i say that there's these like these little you know, tidbits of stuff that clearly expands into larger and larger things as their career progresses. And even, yeah. you know, even the the way they shoot scenes, like the way that they direct just dialogue is actually very subtly unique from a lot of other filmmakers in that, like, they never ever, I mean, with a few exceptions, but for the most part, when they're shooting two people talking, there's like never over the shoulder that they always have this great way because I think they trust their actors so much mm. they always put the camera in between the two characters and mm. it's always like a wider lens but it's a medium shot so they're still mm-hmm. like they're not right up in someone's face so you're getting almost the entire upper half of someone's body there's a lot of shot reaction shot as opposed yeah, exactly. to exactly you know two furs are like over the shoulders yeah mm-hmm. and so they and so they i think the way they do that makes it it's like almost this really blunt way of shooting dialogue Mm-hmm. just like their humor is very blunt like they have a very blunt and sarcastic but sincere if that makes any sense sense of humor that i think works so well which obviously you know if if their direction style didn't match that i don't think they'd be nearly as successful as they are but because they have this perfect match between like their artistry and their senses of humor that are probably even beyond them just as filmmakers i'm sure they carry that sense of humor very much through them because I, you know, in interviews, they're pretty funny guys too, um, or at least <laughs> dryly know, funny. But yeah. yeah, yes, exactly. And and so, I think it's really interesting though, just that yeah, you get this like perfect marriage of of like technical ability and um, just creative uh, style in this in this really unique way, but, which I think is yeah. Well, and you know, the, and the one thing too, I just want to say, and I feel like this, I don't know if watching films like this shaped this in me or if it was in me and it's why I love these films so much. Mm-hmm. But I have always had this extreme soft spot. I'm trying, I'm going to try to find a way to articulate it here. This extreme soft spot of, or, or love, whatever you want to call it, place in my heart for really outrageous things executed extremely competently and seriously right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's like 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 when i was a kid it was like i almost liked weird al yankovic but i was like you know it's not executed well enough like this would be funny if the if if his recordings actually sounded better 
than the master yeah. recordings from the artist, but they never sounded as good to me as the master recordings from the actual artist he was parroting. I, I, like, all due respect, Weird Al is awesome. I'm not saying Weird Al is not awesome, but in my mind, it was almost like, like if you took, you know, the 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 absolute best cinematic skills, but just applied them to the most ridiculous subject matter or something you know mm -hmm. i don't know and, and i and i and i don't know if it's like watching films like this is what kind of keyed that in for me but i was like this is so superbly executed it's so well shot it's so well written it's so well acted but it's totally ridiculous and goofy mm -hmm. yeah but but, but and there, but there's even in in all of that there's still heart and there's still there's like still something else there's there's it's not just ridiculous and it's all so it's almost like it's like this you know beautiful exterior with this really goofy kind of center but then even then then dig further underneath the goofiness and it's like serious again i yeah i yeah. I, 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 I i wish that i were smarter to be able to describe this better i hope that people out here can understand what i'm talking about but it's it's just it's like you see a lot of like comedies now, especially in today's day and age, you'll see these comedies where it's just, it's like, I don't even know what to say. It's like, they're executed crap. And it, um, I mean, even it, it's, uh, how to even describe it? Do you, well, you I get what, the, save me, yeah, save no, me. I, Do you see what I'm saying? I totally it's know like, what you mean, though, is that it's, there's this, there's this disconnect between this assumption that there are certain genres that require less of a, an understanding or skill around the art form and that that certain genres like comedy for example can be saved by things other than filmmaking skills and that they can be saved by simply on the virtue of of good writing or simply on the virtue of good performances and stuff like that and yet what you get very specifically with the coens is people who are very funny but also great performances but also people who understand film to such a degree that they're able to execute that humor in such a specifically cinematic style well and versus it, just it, it, and that's what i mean versus serious. just having something be funny because it's funny and, and you're filming it whereas they 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 use every single aspect of cinema in their in their yes humor. yes um, and and use it with a high degree like a seriousness in in uh they, they, they're taking the execution seriously yeah, yeah and they mean everything they say and they're competent as all hell and and i to me that just makes the content uh like the humor in the film just exponentially more effective mm -hmm. and of course i mean look this is kind of duh right i mean uh you know but i feel like it's so lacking in so many comedies I see today now, especially, I mean, I don't even know if we have films. Do we have films like this anymore today? I don't know. I, I watch less and less current films. And, well, yeah, and I don't think to my detriment. To make a movie like this. Just but do we, do we have, do we have films it. like this? And, yeah. you know, and, and even again, like, I'll, you know, f f films that kind of came out a few years after this. I mean, you have kind of like the Naked Gun series, which I feel mm -hmm. like were some slapstick films that were out at this time. You had, you know, like I said, the Ace Ventura films, which came out, of course, in the mid or early 90s. Mm -hmm. So a few years after this, I mean, you had like the airplane movies, you know, that were in the set. I mean, there's always been slapstick movies movies but i feel like this is head and shoulders above those in my opinion not that they those aren't funny movies in their own right it, it, but just the level of execution mm -hmm. you know it's like you know shakespeare writing comedic a comedic play you know i mean it's just this the sharpness the specificity the competency with all of the different layers of cinematic grammar well, and um, I was going to say too, like in totally in that line, that I think one of the things that that makes the Coen so good at too is that they're really, really good at directing drama as well. Absolutely. And so when you infuse that into comedy, and you have people who actually take this, these, even though like I made the joke earlier that there's like no stakes in the film, and that's to us, it's and not it's, entirely it's, true. But you mean to the characters, aren't... the stakes are very high. Yeah. Like, and that's the difference. That's the thing is it's not like the characters are going through and not caring about anything and are impartial. 
the characters, this is life or death. Like this is like the most important well, thing that they've done. And so that's what, and when you have characters that believe that, even though we are looking at it with this kind of like innocent gaze and, and this like relatively, um, you know, positive spin on, on even the negative moments, you still have directors who are really competent at directing drama. So because of that, the characters are able to react to the drama in the story in a, in a really grounded way that I think brings it to another level versus something like an airplane, which I love airplane. Yeah. And yet you would never, you, you never have, you know, everything in airplane is still farcical. Like it's still, it's supposed to be humorous and farcical. Well, it's and a series of gags and, that, yeah, that exactly. movie is a series of gags and Ace Ventura is a series of gags. And that's, this is not, this, mm -hmm. this has gags, but this is not a series of gags. I, I would add to this, um, something. I think you, you, you spark something, an idea in me. It, it's it's not that there aren't stakes in the film or that they're not high, but they're different than what... The stakes aren't that we think that Nick Cage high is going to get shot by the police or by mm -hmm. the... Um, uh, what is the name of the gas station? The shortstop? Uh, oh, yeah. Clerk. Uh, or the or you know the, the guy in the grocery store with the shotgun. We don't think that he's going to... But, but the stakes are the relationships. Mm -hmm. The stakes are, are these two characters going to be able to be together? Are they going to have a family? Are they going to figure this out? What, you know, it's not even, we're not worried about the baby. You know, we know the baby's going to be fine. This is not that kind of movie. We know immediately what kind of movie this is. You know, nobody's mm -hmm. going to get hurt. The baby's not going to get hurt. Characters aren't going to get shot. Nobody's going to die. At least, you know, not in any way that's going to be tragic. Um, but there is actual real stakes in the relationship between the main characters, you know, Herbert and Edwina, there's real stakes there. Yeah. And I think that's maybe, you know, when you talk about that, they have competency as dramatic directors. Um, and I think that's where that shines. I think that's where that comes through is that we really do care about these characters as cartoony as they are. There is still humanity there. And mm -hmm. I, and it's humanity that we recognize in ourselves. Yeah. And I there's think there's emotional that's, stake. And I think even, and, and I would even speak to, you know, you talked about how great they were at creating these, uh, you know, even characters that are in maybe just one scene or they're, you know, peripheral kind of characters. I think we, I think they do a great job of even showing the a little hints of, of real humanity, even in those characters. And even when they're kind of just meant to be comedic, mm -hmm. I think almost every one of these characters, there's something there um, that's, that's very human. And that we recognize. And I think that's often missing from a lot of these just more superficial comedies like Ace Ventura, where sometimes they even get ugly. You know, they're they're like they take their comedy takes a turn in in directions that it's I'm like, hey, yeah, it gets is that like even mean. really funny. Yeah. It, it's a mean. And, you know, I don't think we ever see that. Well, uh, and I think it's interesting, too, that you in brought Cohen's up film. Um, Shakespeare, because I I. I have read and, and done stuff from like the taming of the shrew which oh, is a i just hold on can I, just a quick pause taming of oh, the yeah. shrew uh i just want to give a shout out uh my wife and i uh went to the frida cinema which is an awesome uh independent or non-profit uh cinema here in orange county uh in santa Ana, and saw 10 things i hate about you which is oh, there you go uh, yeah yeah so uh, just kind of like an extrapolation from Taming of the Shrew. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a super but, fun flick from the 90s. Anyway, so shout out to Frida Cinema. Okay, sorry for the introduction. No, no, that, or, that, I mean, that was what I was just going to say was that you, you have this play written in like the 1590s. Mm -hmm. And yet I remember reading it in high school for like, because we had to do a, like scene studies from it and perform it. Right. Um, and it's still being really, really funny. And not only being really, really funny, but also giving an actor so much. Like I remember finding when I heard that my, when my acting to my, my like drama teacher gave me the play, because everyone got a different Shakespeare play they had to do. And he was like, well, you'll probably like this one because it's a comedy. And so gave me it and I had to do it with a scene partner and all that. I remember being like concerned at first that I was like, well, how do you make Shakespeare funny? Like, how do you, how do you, and you don't have to make it funny because it's, it's just <laughs> when you have that level of like, talent in writing things that are funny are just just end up being timeless like they end up being something that there's there's very human elements to, to good senses of humor that are are i think kind of cross the barriers of like generations and so i remember just reading through it and like the scenes that we were actually performing together and 
just immediately being sparked with like all these insp- this inspiration about like oh I could do like this is how I could physically do perform this scene that would be really funny and that would work and it's like you're not you're never working against the 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 um like the actual subject matter you're it really much is enhancing what you're doing as an actor and I see that so much in in stuff like this where their writing is so specific and yet you still see all these actors building on it and and being able to provide like put put performance to those words that I think otherwise you know with perhaps less talented directors or less talented writers or whatever you would end up in a situation where either the writing would be so specific that that there's no actor that's perfect for it or the writing would be so non-specific that everyone is just kind of trying to be funny and add their own flair and add their own sense of humor to it that it ends up just being muddled and I think that's what you see with a lot of you know I think comedies that are are not as good as what the Coens do is just that you you lose that specificity that was you know you kind of stressed that earlier about how like important it is that they are specific about their work um and so yeah I do I do think it's neat that you, you mentioned Shakespeare because I was thinking about that as well where it's like you've got this just the writing is so good and so tight that if you're performing it you just you know where the writer wants you to go even without talking to them and yet you also can add so much to it in performance Um, yeah 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 i think you know and it's interesting i mean you, you talk about kind of specificity you know it's uh it makes me think of you know stories that i've kind of heard where uh i mean the coens are very specific um, I think at least on this film, they extremely specific with their script. I think on all their films, they're very specific with the execution of their script and they they don't generally allow for a lot of improvisation. And at least that's my understanding. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's definitely, it sounds like what was the case on this film to the point where cage, you know, I think wanted to, you know, had a lot more suggestions, wanted to bring, you know, a lot more discussion to the character and things. And the Coens were like, no, <laughs> no. And I almost, you know, we, and, and look, I love Jim Carrey. I absolutely love Jim Carrey, but I imagine, you know, him on the set of like Ace Ventura or something, you know, and it's like, you know, he's just improvising up a storm. I mean, there's not even, even like hardly moon, a script. Right? Like, yeah, yeah. There, there's not even like hardly a script there, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, and so that it's totally different uh, takes on, on things, but. Um, well, and I've heard in interviews too, like Joel sort of say that, you know, people will ask him how much do actors improvise in your stuff and, and all that. And he sort of always responds. He's like, well, I wrote it the way I wrote it for a reason. Right. You know, like it's like the, the there's a there's a specific use for every word in that script and, and they all have specific meaning to be in there. And so very rarely will they say to an actor, Yeah, just you know, figure this out. Right. And I, I, I agree with that on, on a pretty fundamental level actually, that I think that I've never really loved movies that, that are infused with a ton of improv. There obviously are exceptions, like as anything. But for the most part, I find when you get something that's like super improvisational and, you know, it's just people kind of riffing back and forth and seeing what sticks is that you just sort of end up feeling that. Like you feel like there's always just kind of this pause in the energy to let someone riff for a bit and to, <laughs> to get it there. And it's like, what? but I've always just kind of wondered, like if you're you're writing and you're directing them, like why aren't you making these decisions? Like, you right. know, why aren't you? Well, and there's a place for everything. There's a place for everything. I think, you know, some films are just excuses for gas, you know, like, again, just there's a series of gags, a series of jokes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, some films are just very, very loose lattices for that. And that's just not the kind of films that the Coen brothers make. They're uh, hit there. And and I think, too, you know, generally speaking, the Coen brothers stick to pretty, you know, classical story structure. They often take from you know, classical literature, um, you know, they are, they're steeped in that, I think. And I don't think this, the story here is any different. I -hmm. think it, you know, it's, it's highly structured. It's very specific. And every aspect of the film is conscientiously chosen, you know, to that end. Um, And yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the Coen brothers write the way a playwright writes, you know, a sense that, and not only do they do that with their language, right? Where, you know, if you've ever acted for the stage or anything, I mean, you know that y- you don't get up on stage and start, you know, improvising off of a playwright's words. That That's, yes. ju- that's not how that works. Yeah. <laughs> like, often you are even legally bound. I mean, within, you know, obviously sometimes people go up and you have to, you know, 
you go up on your lines and you have to get back to it however you can. But but often, I mean, when you when you buy the rights to perform a play or you're licensing the play to perform it, I mean, it's not an option. Like you have to perform it as it's written, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you're even kind of bound by that in a legal sense when you, when you license the rights to perform it. So, uh, uh, but I think the Coens are not only are they like that with their language, but they're like that with the, every aspect, um, visual and otherwise, but it, I, um, but I, they, you know, look, it, it, I love Airplane 2, and I mean, I'm not a big fan of Ace Ventura, but I'm a, a big fan of Jim Carrey in general. You mentioned uh, Man on the Moon. I, you know, uh, curious to know how much Milos Forman actually kind of allowed him, you know, space there. And that was probably an interesting push and pull between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, maybe we'll pick that film sometime, and maybe that would be a good discussion. But... Uh, yeah, I. But regardless, you know, we talked about Nick Cage not being able to kind of input maybe as much as he had wanted to, but still, his performance here is one of his best. I mean, mm-hmm. Holly oh, Hunter absolutely. is fantastic. John Goodman is fantastic. Of course, John Goodman. Goodman goes on to almost be, you know, like a uh, a regular player. He's mm-hmm. been in so many Coen Brothers films. Uh, Trey Wilson is superb as Nathan Senior. Uh, I mean, even Randall Tex Cobb, who's not even an actor, uh, he's the guy that played the bounty hunter we were talking about that reminded us of uh, some aspects of Mad Max and the Road Warrior. Um, You know, everybody is put to such perfect use here. And Mm -hmm. everybody is such a treat, is such a treat, in my opinion, to see. Um, But I just, gosh, I just can't help to just think back to when I was a kid, dude. And I was watching, I mean, this was, it's one of my most absolute and I was so happy that you picked it. And it's so interesting that you'd not seen it before because watching it as a kid, it was just, you know, you have those cinematic experiences where it's just, a, it, it's just, you have a pure sense of joy where you just feel like every aspect of the film was made for your little heart. Yes. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Now, now, yeah. do I feel that today as an, as a, as a 47 year old, as opposed to when I was 13 Maybe not to the same extent, but but it definitely still presses the right buttons. But I mean, it's just one of those wonderful cinematic experiences where I was just like, this is awesome. The, I, they have my sense of humor. <laughs> I mean, that's and that's there's nothing better than than I love watching a movie where like, again, not to to say that I could make this or could make it. But when you when you see a director make choices and you're like that's a choice that I would make. Like, that's like, I have like, you kind of feel the, like a camaraderie in the sensibilities of like, man, I feel like I could, you know, not again, make this, you know, these are two are incredibly talented filmmakers, but sort of sit there and go like, yeah, that I, I couldn't think of a better way to do that. Like that would be, (laughs) that's, and and so there's something really fun about, um, you know, it it almost is, uh, you get more involved in the film as it goes on and as, as it uh, unfolds before you. Yeah. Yeah. I was just really, really pleasantly surprised that you'd picked it. And I totally thought that you would have seen it before. So it's like on this, on this recording is the first time I'm like, what? You hadn't seen it. I mean, there's other things we could, you know, the soundtrack is, I, I think it's just, you know, so wonderfully chosen. It's, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I remember how, you know, that aspect of it seemed kind of so surreal, but so perfect. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, I don't, the yodeling, I don't even know, am I using, is that, is that what it is? Is it yodeling? I, I'm so sorry that I'm so ignorant of this, but just that, you know, the, the kind of the main theme that's repeated over and over again. And I love how, you know, when he's in the supermarket, that theme is repeated with like, but it's in the Muzak, you know, over the speakers and the, yes. <laughs> you know, and it's like so perfectly done. Um, I, it's just uh, every aspect of it. It uh, was just so cool. And, you know, and um, we had talked about too, you know, the cinematography. You'd, you'd mentioned Raimi before, and I just want to kind of speak a little more specifically to this piece before we wrap up. But it was later that I did see Evil Dead. I saw Evil Dead Two, and then I think I saw um, Army of Darkness, and then I saw Evil Dead One. Just kind of my order of those films, watching those. I think I, I was the same. Yeah, I think I had the and, exact same. Order. And I remember that, like, I you know, the Raimi cam. I don't know the underslung, like, you know, I, I think they like put a camera on like a. I don't even know if it's actually a uh, 
a steady camera. I think it's two by fours. I think they literally just underslung it on a two by four and just, you know, two people just ran with it. But, you know, you see that in this film too. And you talked about how uh, they were friends with Raimi. And I remember connecting that, you know, so as I'm like starting to kind of formulate like, oh, you know, directors are people and they're like friends with each other and they like help you know and they kind of inspire each other and oh yeah look i remember that shot from the dream sequence in raising arizona where you know we've got this demon in his dream that's like coming to get him through the window and Mm -hmm. hey wait that's the exact same shot in this you know um i I don't know you know it's just kind of all of that was so formative to me all of those films were kind of there and i think because they were so stylized it helped me kind of realize as a kid that like style was a thing yes. because it was yeah. so obvious if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe next we'll have to do a, a Raimi movie. <laughs> we could do a Raimi film. We could do, you know, I mean, look, there's so many films. I, I, th- I think I know what I'm going to pick, but uh, yeah, there's, there's, that, that's the, that, that's what I love about this is that you mm-hmm. just never seem to run out of good films. Well, any, any parting thoughts here uh, as we kind of wrap up, anything else you'd like to touch base on that we didn't get a chance I don't to? Think, I think we've, I think we've covered it all. I mean, again, yeah. it's a great movie. I would highly recommend if you haven't seen it like me, Yeah, um, go check it out. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's uh it's a super easy watch, like really, really engaging yep. and really, really great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, thanks for picking it. It was so fun to revisit it and to discuss it here with you today. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody out there. Uh, until next time, we'll catch you on the flip side. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.